Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, students, faculty, our distinguished guests. On behalf of the African Public Health Network, I'd like to welcome you all to Faces of Africa 2018. Faces of Africa is an event hosted by the African Public Health Network. We've been around for about 27 years now. <laughs> and our focus has been, and still remains, serving as a platform where we can discuss and bring to the fore public health issues affecting the African continent. This year's event of Faces of Africa is quite unique for us because um, it was a bit difficult coming up with a theme and a subject to discuss but we settled on talking about the African health story. And I'm sure some of you will probably be asking the question, why the African health story? Why is there a need for a retelling of the African health story? Well, I like to think, I may be wrong, that it's common knowledge that health interventions in Africa have a lot of times been developed, um, some homegrown, but quite a bit of them, a substantial amount, have been developed outside the continent. And these interventions in form of policies and all have produced very marginal results, particularly in the sub-Saharan region. And today with us, we have someone who is renowned for using storytelling as a tool to communicate social issues to people all around the world and also on the African continent. And we hope that in our conversation with her, in our conversation also amongst ourselves in this room, we'll be able to answer certain questions like, how can we use storytelling as a tool to reframe our interventions and policies in Africa? How can we use storytelling from people within the continent of Africa to restructure or to create new policies that perhaps can, can give us the healthy Africa which we all desire? So today we're going to share perspective and also ideas. But before I close my opening remarks, I would like to learn the quote from one of our most revered, of course, although now late, um, storytellers, who is in the person of Chinua Achebe. Um, in his book, which um, was published a while ago, um, The Education of a British Protected Child, he made a very interesting reference. And it was, to, it was in discussing and talking about a particular jurist, a prominent jurist in Germany by the name of Wolfgang Ziegler. Now, Ziedler was a prominent lawyer and jurist in Germany, and he had a plan of retiring from his work in Germany and going to Namibia, and in Namibia, doing some good work with their legal system. But after reading the book, Things Fall Apart, he had a change of mind. And I quote, but how was it that this prominent German jurist carried such a blind spot about Africa all his life? Did he never read the papers? Why did he need an African novel to open his eyes? My own theory is that he needed to hear Africa speak for itself after a lifetime of hearing Africa spoken about by others. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. And now it is my honor to uh, introduce our author, Ms. Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. Nigerian writer Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie is the leading African writer of her generation. She grew up on the campus of the University of Nigeria, Unsuka, where her father was a professor and her mother was the first female registrar. She entered the university to study medicine and pharmacy, but left the US at the age of, seven, at the age of 19 to continue her education along a different path. Ms. Adichie graduated summa cum laude from Eastern Connecticut State University with a degree in communication and political science, and subsequently received a master's degree in creative writing from Johns Hopkins University, followed by a master of arts degree in African history from Yale University. Among her many accolades, she was awarded a Hodder Fellowship at Princeton University for the 2005-2006 academic year and later a fellowship at the Radcliffe Institute of Harvard University for the 2011-2012 academic year. In 2008, Ms. Adichie earned a coveted MacArthur Genius Award. Ms. Adichie's work is read around the world and has been translated into over 30 languages. Her first novel, Purple Hibiscus, uh, won the Commonwealth Prize, and her second novel, Half of a Yellow Sun, 
won the Orange Prize, which is the world's top prize for female writers. Her, 2012, her 2013 novel, Americana, has received numerous accolades, including the US National Book Critics, uh, Critics Circle Award. It was named one of the New York Times' top 10 best books of 2013. Ms. Adichie has been invited to speak around the world, and most notably, her 2009 TED Talk, The Danger of a Single Story, is now one of the top 10 most viewed TED Talks in the history of the series, with over 14 million views. Her 2012 TED Talk, We Should All Be Feminists, has, a, has uh, started a worldwide conversation about feminism and was published as a book in 2014. Her most recent book, Dear Ijewele, or A Feminist Manifesto and 15 Suggestions, was published in March 2017. Ms. Adichie is committed to assisting young aspiring writers. As one of her commitments, she leads an annual writer's workshop in Nigeria, for which applications come from around the world. It is now my privilege and pleasure to introduce Ms. Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. And just to introduce myself, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, my name is Vinayak Bhardwaj. I'm an MPH student here at Johns Hopkins. I'm from Zimbabwe and uh, very delighted to, to be asked by the uh, APHN to moderate this discussion, which hopefully will be more about our colleagues here than uh, about the few remarks I have to make. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation. Thank you so much for coming. And thank you also to the stellar efforts of the APHN committee. Please give them a round of applause. Ms. Adichie, all of us who've read your books are familiar with uh, parts of Baltimore much more than we were um, just by visiting these areas. I think parts of Charles Village, where I live, are illuminated by some of the writing you've, you've produced. And I wonder what it's like for you returning back here. Um, how has it changed? Uh, could you share some of your sort of pleasant experiences here, maybe some of your favorite writing spots? I know some of us are still finalizing capstone papers. So. <laughs> What are capstone papers? Capstone papers is just like a, almost like a mini thesis. Ah, okay. Not um, so mini for some of you. <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, th thank you. Um, and I'm happy to be here. And um, I'm here mostly because of um, certain Nigerians who put great pressure on me to come. <laughs> And because I have great respect for that incredible Nigerian ability to just not stop. <laughs> so, Femi. <laughs> I, you know, um, and also because I want to learn and I'm curious about public health and um, because I think public health is so important. And so coming back, I mean, I, I, I live not too far away when I'm in the US. So I have two homes. I live in Nigeria and I live here. And when I'm here, my home is about 35 minutes from here. But Baltimore, when I was here, when I was at Hopkins doing my, um, uh, my, my M MA, which actually it was an MA then, it was a one-year program, I didn't know, I mean, I sort of knew that just the area around Homewood, um, and most of the time, I was locked up in my tiny studio apartment writing. Okay. There's actually a period when there was a when there was, there was sort of a cicada um, uh, infestation. <laughs> Is that the right word? And you know, I was and 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 I didn't know. I didn't know for about three days because I hadn't gone anywhere. I was in my apartment. <laughs> just walking furiously, being a little crazy. I would take breaks and jump rope, in, in, and I had a very tiny studio. And then I would order um, Chinese chicken and broccoli, and then I would have just plain toast, and then I'd go back writing. And I, didn't, I don't think I looked out, even looked out the window. So three days later, when I walked out the building, I just thought, what the hell? <laughs> you know, I, and I will, that, for me, was sort of an example of my life in Baltimore. But, um, <laughs> 
suits. And I remember thinking, you know, something major might have happened and I wouldn't have known because I was so immersed in this, in this writing. But um, I don't know how, how um, there's a cafe called One World. Oh. The thing is, there's no meat. So I don't know if Nigerians will like it. <laughs> it's vegetarian. Um, but I, I would sometimes go there with friends. <laughs> and I guess uh, that was a sort of um, gateway into asking the wider question of your sense of the US um, currently. Uh, many of us arrived in June last year and felt as if we'd arrived in the middle of a family fight. Um, a fight that's still going on and one in which even the kids are saying enough is enough, uh, to their immense credit. Indeed. And, uh, your, your New Yorker piece was a kind of rousing call to action shortly after mm -hmm. Trump was elected. And I wonder how you feel now uh, about the kind of political moment we're seeing where we have several grassroots movements, many of which are unapologetically feminist in character, sort of rising up s somewhat in response to the kind of deep fallibilities of the present president. You, I really love your politeness. <laughs> it's very lovely and so well put, but you know, I could use language that is not so polite, but I won't. Um, <laughs> I have a visa application pending. <laughs> shouldn't be too smug either because I, I have a green card and apparently we live, <laughs> we live yeah. in a time where even green cards We're can be revoked, it right? It can be sent back at the airport. But, but you know, more seriously, I, I, I feel a sense of um, both urgency and, and just a great sadness and a kind of surprise as well. I think for me, growing up in Nigeria, America was kind of the aspirational center. It was no longer England, which it had been England in my parents' generation. But for us, it was America. And I remember people would have conversations complaining about, about politicians in Nigeria, which is something that we do all the time. And invariably, you would hear somebody say, oh, go to America. That can never happen in America. You know, so the idea of nepotism, um, corruption, um, just the sense that your government was lying to you in mm. a kind of barefaced way, we just felt, oh, it can't happen in America. But, but what's happened for me in this past year is to see that, in fact, it can. It can happen anywhere. And that this idea that democracy is some sort of um, thing that in some parts of the world is strong and can never be challenged is not true. It's not true at all. Mm. There's so much... Uh, that's happened that's made me realize it is so fragile, this thing called democracy, is so fragile. And that in fact, what I believe to be the, the, the kind of, um, the, the, the idea of the institutions as sort of bulwark to, to stupidity is in fact not true, right? Because you, we, have, we have somebody who is, is the president of this country, who's unstable. I mean, and, and if people are not admitting it publicly, it's because they have, reasons not to. It's not because they don't think so. <laughs> and, and I just kind of feel a great sadness. I think it's going to take a long time for the US to, to earn back its, its kind of moral authority. And I say this knowing, of course, America is imperfect. It has many problems. It's, you know, it's been complicit in many terrible things around the world. But there is still there's kind of an American mythology of America being sort of the moral conscience. Of, and, and that's gone. That's really gone. Mm -hmm. And living in both places, I, it just feels very odd. I mean, there are times I, I want to stop reading the news because it's absurdity upon absurdity. And then I get angry about the way the media covers it because I think, no, you cannot use the tools you learned at Columbia Journalism School to cover this person. It doesn't work, right? You can't, I mean, if somebody opens his mouth and, Yeah, but it's, it is, um, it's very difficult. But also even th that it has consequences for all of us, right? So that, that somebody who doesn't understand policy, who really is, it's a kind of stubborn ignorance. So it's all about the person's ego. And so you can, you can decide overnight, you know, to cancel that, that program. You don't know, for example, that it means that there is a woman in sub-Saharan Africa who will no longer have access to affordable reproductive care, you know? And, and for me, that's just, 
it's heartbreaking. Turning our gaze homeward, uh, as, as you've sort of alluded to, things in Africa are a mixture of this kind of growth story, which a certain dimension of media loves to go on about. Mm -hmm. It's also a continent that we all know is deeply challenged. And uh, for a lot of us who will be graduating in a few weeks' time um, who are from Africa, there's always this tension that emerges, which I suspect you've felt and you've written about. And I guess advice is perhaps a, a kind of catch-all term, but I wonder what what you would say to people who are navigating that complex um, terrain of emotional, professional, academic um, mm. uh, you know, difficulty. When you say that the tension, do you mean to stay or to go? To stay or to go. Mm. I don't know. Um, <laughs> I, it's, it's, I find that I sometimes feel a kind of, um, I feel protective of people, particularly people in in sort of health, who are Africans, because I think they face a lot of pressure and that they're often expected to be kind of the sacrificial lambs. So people will say, oh, there's one doctor to, I don't know, two million people in so and so in Africa. Why are you outside Africa? And, and there's a part of me that feels that it shouldn't be the responsibility of the individuals who choose to make their living as health workers. We should be talking about what needs to be done in, in our countries to make it um, a place where people can live. Mm -hmm. All of my friends, because I studied medicine for one year at the University of Nigeria, which really meant nothing. So it was sort of, you know, <laughs> it, just, it was sort of biology. And, you know, <laughs> but it, it was enough for me to know that it was not right for me. Um, I think it was the dissection of frogs. <laughs> I just did it. I just thought, this, this is, no, it's not going to happen. And I left, and many of my friends who, who then ended up becoming doctors who were in my class in first year, many of them are here in the US. And, and, and the ones in Nigeria are all very keen to leave. And there's something about it that it's, so I don't know, I don't know that I can give advice. Obviously, I think we need more people back in Africa. And people who who know what they're doing. <laughs> I say I have family then, and when I'm when I'm back in Nigeria, I don't have. A friend of mine was saying to me, "Do you have Medivac? Um, do you have Medivac? Do you have Medivac?" And I was like, oh, "What's that?" <laughs> and they're like, "No, because if you get sick, then you can be, you can you know you can get on a plane and they can take you out." And I realized I actually don't have wow. <laughs> Medivac. So when I'm in Lagos, I'm at the mercy of this lovely clinic I go to in Lagos. But then I started thinking, maybe I should get Medivac, right? This, now I have a two-year-old daughter, oh my God. But even that made me start to think about what it means. You know, there's something about it that on the one hand, of course I understand my friend asking me to get Medivac. You know, it's a, it's a kind of practical thing. But then on the other, I want Nigeria to be a country where we don't need to, to talk about that. You know, that, that there's so many people who've died who shouldn't have died. My father, um, my parents, are, they live in Nigeria. They come here every summer. But the, my father is 86 years old. He's diabetic. He has um, high blood pressure. He, and he wants to be in ancestral hometown, which means that the doctor he can see doesn't really have many of the resources. And so I'm constantly anxious, you know, constantly. And when my dad sees the doctor, we, I call the doctor, my sister calls the doctor. You know, I'm sure we're, we're very annoying to the doctor, but we're like, you know, can you tell us what test you do? Can we, you know? and, and even that, I think, comes from a place of, of knowing that the healthcare system, which has some really dedicated, intelligent people, mm. but there, it's, there's a fundamental problem with, I think, the, the foundation of it. I think there's a sort of a complex humanity to your approach to the to, to this question because for a lot of us there is this tension all the time and it, and there is as you characterize it a sense of you're deserting the the mm. mothership mm. and perhaps to talk about African public health um, and Femi's remarks at the beginning definitely alluded to this, but there is this single story phenomenon to African health where either this, the, the desperately needy recipient of charity mm. or where the sort of experimental testing ground for some startup fad, whether it's mm. airdropping medicines through drones and so on, all of which may be good, yeah, but there's no so sense in which there's something <laughs> more <laughs> imaginative. And I, and I think, for all of us, mm. we, we know intimately well that there are our forebears in policy making. In, I come from Zimbabwe. Bernard Chizero was one of the top economists, at, I think, trained at Harvard. He came to Zimbabwe and implemented st structural adjustment with a 
uh, with a fever and a rigor that was probably unprecedented on the continent. It broke our public system. And I, and I think he didn't leave Harvard or wherever he studied thinking he's going to go back and destroy the public system in Zimbabwe when he goes back. He probably did go with good intentions. And how do we marry these good intentions with the quantitative tools and all the, the, the skills we're developing here and resist falling into caricature, which mm. seems the inevitable consequence in some cases. Yeah, I don't know that you can resist it. Yeah. I think the whole point is that you will become caricature. Mm -hmm. No, all right, to be more hopeful and optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I agree with you about the question of intent. I don't think that many of the, I think that there are good intentions behind many of these, these projects. For me, the, the problem often is that it, it's, it's often not rooted in the reality of where these people are doing the work. Mm. So I'll give you an example. When, I'm, when I, I attend sort of conferences at American universities and when they start to talk about um, data from Africa, and I can talk about Nigeria because I know Nigeria well, I'm often asking, how did you collect this data? Because I know Nigeria and I know I'm like, how? <laughs> <laughs> Honestly. So even that is already, I think, problematic. But then there, there are other things like people who are just, I think that simple things would be helpful, like listening, mm -hmm. right? Like going to these places and actually listening and realizing that you don't have to use the same tools that you use in the US in Africa. It, it doesn't have to be the same to achieve the same results. And, and an example would be um, a friend of mine who's a, who's a, um, a doctor in, in England, and he's, he's Nigerian, we grew up together, and he was telling me how they had, he had gone with a team back to Nigeria, and his English friends were all horrified because they thought Nigerian doctors were not doing enough about patient privacy and letting the patient make the decision. And, and I just remember thinking, but you have to think about things in that context. There's some people who are not equipped mm -hmm with the knowledge to make that kind of decision, right? And so we have to assume that the doctor means the best for the patient and can sort of guide the patient. That this is, it's not the years. I remember coming here and being a bit frustrated by doctors who just would say to me, well, what do you think? And I'm thinking, well, you went to medical school. I didn't. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> and, and on the one hand, there's a part of me that understands, obviously, the need to have the patient, you know, to carry the patient along. But, it can seem, and obviously I'm in a position to make decisions because I'm educated, I can, you know, but there are people who, who aren't. And I think to assume that the same tools one uses in the US would apply to Africa is, it, it, I don't think that's a, a very helpful. But then on the other hand, there is the kind of approach of the Africans as hapless and, you know, you need to spoon feed them what they need. Africans know what they need. You know, I, and. I'm a great believer in local knowledge, and I'm a great believer in listening to people. And th th there's something about being in a, a very sort of places like this, mm -hmm. Hopkins, you know, Harvard, and that kind of thing, that makes people think that they know all the answers. And I think it's very useful to start off thinking that one doesn't know all the answers, especially in places like ours. In Africa, the African continent is in its complexity, in its diversity, in its wonder, in its magic. It's important to keep that in mind, I think, um, for people who are doing very, very useful work. The reason I rolled my eyes when you talked about um, certain startup things like, you know, drop in, whatever, I find myself, my first skepticism is my first sort of approach to many of these things because Yeah. <laughs> well, I think, I think it, uh, skepticism is the approach. We're now trying very hard. Everything depends in this course, in this, in this degree. <laughs> My next question is about gender equality. Um, as I speak, I belong to a class that is 60% female. More women than men are graduating in the US from medical school. Uh, even here at Hopkins, I believe it was 50-50 last year in the final year of medical school. And, but then, of course, if you look at public health and medicine, uh, in the US, the data shows that women earn 27, women physicians earn 27% less than their male counterparts. Male registered nurses earn $5,000 uh, more than their female peers. And if we look at global health, just two years, three years ago in 2015, 
less than a quarter of delegations to the World Health Organizations were led by women. And there are real consequences to this. Laurie Garrett, who is a Pulitzer winning um, observer of global health issues, says that uh, there's a direct relationship between the number of women involved in crafting some of global health policies and the attention paid to maternal mortality, for example. Mm. And of course, one solution for all of us would be to read your book. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I wonder if you might share some words of encouragement, of inspiration to the women in this room who are going to be leaders in public health. The trend is inevitable. And also maybe to the men who are likely to report to some of the women in this audience. All right, dear men. <laughs> Get over yourself. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, do, I that I'm actually I, I didn't know that that it's it's pretty much 50-50 graduating. Hmm. But then of course what I'm curious about is so 50-50 graduating, if we follow them and track them and in 15 years, who's heading the most prestigious programs? Who's, you know, um, I mean, I just, I think women can. It's not, it's, it's not for me a thing of surprise that women are leaders because I've always known <laughs> that women can lead um, just as well as men can. And if anything, I think what I would say to my, my sisters in the audience is um, don't, don't forget that you matter equally. And I say this because women can be as intelligent, as, as accomplished, but they're cultural norms and cultural ideas that, that get in the way. Um, the, so the, it, I think it's women leaders who often spend a lot of time thinking about how to handle things in a way that still leaves them likable. Mm -hmm. In a way that men, it just doesn't occur to men to think about that because men aren't raised. And it's not, it's not even, I think every human being likes to be liked. We all want to be liked, but it's women who are raised to think they need to be liked. It's women who are raised to think that, you know, I can't speak out too loudly because they're going to say I'm a bitch. I can't, I have to be careful because I don't want to come across as aggressive or too pushy. Men just do, right? Because nobody stole them from the time they were six months old to be nice, to be. And so what I would say to women is, you know what, you don't have to play that game because Many people like you as you are. So, and those people for whom you're performing don't really like you. So if you need to tell them, <laughs> this is true. It's true though. And so if you need to tell somebody off who's not doing their work, tell them off. It's actually good for them. And, and for my brothers, I would say, apart from get over yourselves, which I really mean, um, I would say, and, and I say this with great affection, but the other thing I would say is if you're in a position of power, hire women. And, and remember that when you, and, and I say this, not because I'm, I'm saying that you need to do a walk of charity, but I'm saying hire women who are qualified. But remember that just like the men you hire, the women just need to be good enough. You don't need to hire men who are good enough and then look for women who are exceptionally, exceptionally, exceptionally good. The, the women just need to be as good as the men. And I think this is part of the problem of what, what happens when, so it's 50-50 when they graduate, they're all sort of done equally well. As they go higher up, you start to see that women fall back. And there are a number of reasons, are complex reasons, I think. I think, I think women um, choosing to be mothers gets in the way. I think it's terrible that we live in a world that doesn't think it's important to support the people whose bodies do the work to make sure that our species will continue to thrive. It's, for me, it's a, I mean, I feel very strong. I mean, I get very angry about it because people say things like, well, but you know, a woman chooses to get pregnant, so she needs to understand her job won't be waiting for her. And I feel like, well, what if all women choose not to? Do we, do we want to go extinct, <laughs> right? I mean, it's, it's the woman's body who does the work. So we need, to, we need to structure society. I think, for example, that if I were to run sort of corporations and whatever, there would be childcare there, completely free, high quality childcare. The childcare workers would be paid very well. Um, you know, women would have time off. The jobs would be waiting for them because they're bloody well keeping the species alive. Um, fathers would be forced, not they would be forced to take time off as well so that they know how to bloody well change the diapers. And I really do think that these things are important. And I think that they then kind of feed into 
it will be better for the corporation. The, your, your, your people are, are happier, right? They're going to give more at work. So economically, you will thrive, actually. But it just seems to me a very short-sighted, ridiculously narrow capitalist view of sort of profit, profit, profit. Mm. Therefore, people are not human. All right, I'll stop. But no. Um, so yeah. That, that. <laughs> Lastly, and I, and I really would like to hear from colleagues in the room, but I know all of us are familiar with your enormous success, the citation that sort of uh, mentioned the milestone achievements, your rebuke of Beyonce's brand of feminism, and so on. OK, OK, I need to address that. <laughs> it, it's so exhausting. It was not a rebuke. I, mean, I think people like the idea of a cat fight, <laughs> and it's just very upsetting. No, honestly, honestly, I, I think Beyonce is really cool. Well, the point I was making, and I, in fact, had to sort of <laughs> talk to this journalist, this Dutch woman who I had liked until then. Um, <laughs> I think that people, no, my, my point was, so, so here's an example. If I said, as I've said here today, I think, which is, I just really wish women didn't constantly think about being likable. It's not a rebuke to women. Right? It's, it's a comment about sort of this larger societal and cultural force. So what I had said was about Beyonce that it's such a shame that we constantly, um, th that it's about men. Right? It's about, you know, put a ring on it. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's a kind of female worldview that's male-centered in a way that a male worldview isn't necessarily um, female-centered, no. right? And so that's what I had said. And, and these people decided to make it about she says how feminism is superior to Beyonce's, which I hadn't, right? And, and I don't even think of feminism as something that has hierarchies, where somebody's feminism is somehow, you know, pure. I mean, it's ridiculous. Mine isn't as male-focused. But I also suspect that mine isn't as mainstream, <laughs> quite frankly, right? Because the reality of women's lives is that, you know, from the time that you're really small, you're told, it, it's the, the male focus of your socialization. You're told to be careful around men because they will rape you or kill you, right? You're told, be careful what you wear. It's about men. You're told, um, learn to cook and clean. And it's not for yourself. It's so that you keep a man. Mm. You're, told, yeah. you're told, don't say everything you think. You have to be very careful, and you have to be diplomatic, and you have to, again, it's about men. I mean, there's, there's, so all of that, I think actually that the honest feminism probably represents the reality of women's lives more than mine, which is very much a feminism of, you know what? F it, right? <laughs> which is, yeah. I know I'm at Hopkins. <laughs> But which is really a way of saying, I, I, I think, you know, I think love is a wonderful thing. I love love. But I just really deeply feel very strongly about that idea that women should, should shape their lives, not based on their own needs, but somehow on the idea of maleness, you know. So it was not a rebuke, is what I'm saying. I like Beyonce. She's very cool. And, she's, and, and also, she, I think that she's very sincere in wanting to have a conversation about gender and feminism, right? People, I, I don't think that it's a valid criticism to say that because she's commercial or because she, therefore, somehow it's not worth engaging with. Absolutely. Um, I guess, a, apart from the sort of public persona that, that you sort of uh, present and you're a cultural icon for many of us and, and for a role model for a lot of us, I often find a pressure on role models is the kind of pressure not to mention their mistakes, not to mention mm. things they could have done differently. And mm. I, we're all at a stage of our lives where we have the opportunity both to make mistakes and to mm. rectify them. Mm. Um, and as we, as we think through our next steps, I would, I would be very grateful if, you would be, if you'd indulge us by sharing some things that you think deviate from the kind of iconic uh, sort of image we have. Oh, you mean tell you the terrible things about me? <laughs> Not necessarily. Just things you, you now will look behind yeah, We don't have enough time. <laughs> okay. I just need you to know that. You, you do not know. But here's the thing. I mean, <laughs> I don't even think of myself as a role model. And I also think that my, um, you know, I feel very grateful to be read. I feel very grateful to, um, to matter in a certain kind of way. But I also know that my public, my public position and persona isn't one that is, um, 
You know, it's not like a Mandela. The, the people for whom my take on feminism is cause for great hostility. And um, it's not always pleasant. I cannot begin to tell you some of the emails I get. Um, but, but at the same time, because my, my because literature is my religion, I, I'm, I'm a person who starts off with the idea that all, all of us are flawed, which is also why I believe in the possibility of change and in the possibility of getting better. And I think my talk, um, The Danger of a Single Story, was kind of about that, because it's important for me to make myself complicit. And I think it's also why there's, certain, there's a certain strain of discourse in the American left that makes me uncomfortable. And I say that because I consider the American left my, my, my tribe. It's sort of my natural home. I think, for example, that in general, the ideas that are thought of as progressive and on the left are just better ideas. That, that's what I believe. Right? And so, so the left would kind of be my natural home. But the, there's certain things about it that can leave me uncomfortable, one of which is the idea that, that we, that it's kind of a moral superiority, a kind of, um, you know, you failed and you're a terrible mm. person and you're, it makes me very uncomfortable because I think it closes conversations. Right. I think that across this country, there are many people who cannot say what they think because they're so worried. I mean, so I'll give you a very tiny example. I was at dinner, uh, maybe two years ago, with a, a bunch of very well-meaning liberals, you know, all <laughs> the people who recycle and who don't buy clothes that were <laughs> made, that, that sort of thing. And I remember I told the story about, um, I had spoken at the Royal Festival Hall in London, and this woman, white woman, English woman, who backstage was so nervous about introducing me, and so she kept trying to pronounce my name properly backstage, and she was walking up and down saying, Chi Mama. <laughs> and I said to her, you know, don't stress, but she kept doing it, and then she got on stage, and she sort of read this lovely introduction, and then she said, please welcome Chimichanga. <laughs> so. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Yes, this happened. <laughs> but I remember, um, and she turned red. And then usually what happens at my events is I, usually the sort of the first two rows are what my manager calls the Afro girls. Oh, yeah. So I usually have these fierce black women with natural hair. They're like, they're like she's ours, so watch it, right? So, so, my, so my Afro girls in front were like, what? So they were like, no, 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 no. So this woman turned red. And, and then when she came out, I felt so sorry for her. But telling the story later, I remember at this dinner of liberals, and, and this man said to me, I can't believe you're laughing about it. I can't believe you're... And I remember thinking, but why shouldn't I laugh about it, right? Yeah. So, so I think the appropriate response of the morally righteous liberal to that would be a kind of anger. Oh, and, and maybe find a way to make it about, I don't know, cultural appropriation of the, of the subaltern, something. Yeah. But I think that in, in, in a lot of these discourses, there's a humanity that we're losing. Yeah. And that, that really, it makes me uncomfortable. Absolutely. You know? And it, it makes me increasingly less willing even to engage, because I just feel like it's going to end up, you know, no, nobody, and, and in the end, we don't change anything. I want to change minds. I want to, and for me, which is also my, my take on feminism, I want to engage with everyone. I mean, well, maybe not everyone. I mean, <laughs> the kind of people who say that they're men's rights movements or sort of, no, no, there's no point, <laughs> right? But there, there are people in the middle, there are people in the middle, and, and it's important to engage, and also important to make a distinction between, between sort of what is malicious and what is just ignorance or just curiosity, really, you know? Um, so this is sort of a roundabout way of saying that the times that have failed have been very many. <laughs> um, the times that I have wanted to do better have also been very many. The times when I've realized I haven't done as well as I could have, have also been many. If anything, um, I find that I'm, what I've, <laughs> I feel like you're my therapist now. <laughs> <laughs> I've been walking on trying to stop holding on to resentment. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting a little better at it. No. <laughs> it's true though. <laughs> and, and with that, um, <laughs> Really, colleagues, please, uh, you know, join me in giving to Amanda a hand, but also please uh, think of your questions now and, and how you'd like to uh, get going. Joe, I know you'll be managing the poll everywhere, and uh, Joe and Larissa have, have taken charge of that, and I think there'll be roving mics as well. So, uh, yeah. 
So the way we're going to try and do it is two questions from the audience and one question from Paul Everywhere, because there's a web webcast audience as well. Uh. So we want to try and include them, and maybe shy people who don't want to ask questions in person. Hi, good what afternoon. You? Chimamanda. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> I have the same problem because my name is Waijia and I'm from Singapore and from the MPH program. Thank you so much for your wonderful, wonderful sharing. Thank um, you. One of my questions is, how has being a mother helped you or prevented you from being where you want to be? Thank you. Um, I have a two and a half year old, old, old daughter who is the light of my life. I adore her. I'm also terrified of her. <laughs> it's true. That child is fierce, so she scares me. And, um, and my husband said to me the other day, you finally met your match. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, but, but I think, I'm actually, I've been thinking about it a lot because I feel as though I wasn't prepared. And, and I'm told that nobody's ever really prepared for motherhood. But I wonder, I've also wondered if maybe the things I read and heard before having her didn't quite prepare me for what really was that for the first time in my life, anxiety came to stay. I mean, anxiety has become such a part of me in a way that it never was before. I, I was anxious after she was born. I was anxious about just the basic sort of biological things like breastfeeding. She wasn't latching on well. I was, I'd read all these books about if you don't breastfeed for six months, your child would not be happy in life. <laughs> and so, which I think we need to stop. We need to stop doing that to women, honestly. So she wasn't latching on. I went into panic. I was like, I must breastfeed her for six months. I don't care what. And so I, it was really a very anxious time for me. And actually, it's funny, I've never talked about this publicly, but. I might as well. Um, so there's the anxiety of just sort of doing physical things where I just worry, is she breathing well when she's sleeping? She's two and a half, but I still do that. <laughs> but also it's a, a sort of a more metaphysical anxiety where I want to protect her from everything. Mm -hmm. And she's just started preschool and I'm just, um, there's a part of me that I'm horrified at what I think are really retrograde gender-based things going on still. Mm -hmm. You know, where, where I was told, oh, that, that class is mostly boys, so they're really loud, so we just let them play more. And I just thought, this is how we start. It's terrible. But, but in terms of my creativity, it, it got in the way of my creativity. And, um, and I also think it's important to talk about that because, you know, and, and, and I wouldn't change it for anything, but there were months after I had her where I just felt my brain wasn't working. And I couldn't, I couldn't, I could not enter my creative space. I couldn't, and that's when I, I found that in my life I'm happiest when I'm writing. That's, I'm, that's, I really think that's what I was born to do. And so because I couldn't enter into that creative space, I had a very difficult time um, the first sort of really seven months. And then it didn't help that she had a protein allergy from the breast milk, and so they put me on a special diet. And so I was, at some point I was just eating plain bread and plain boiled yam, and then I put on, I don't know, 700 pounds. <laughs> and, but I was like, I still have to breastfeed her exclusively for six months, I was mad. <laughs> but, but, but I think this is just to start a larger conversation about the pressures I think that women are faced with. And even that whole idea of breastfeeding, which I think is wonderful and all, but I think it's, it's, it's important to tell women, if you're having difficulty, give her formula. She, she won't die, you know? Because, and I don't know how much of the time that I wasted being so anxious, I could have just spent bonding more with her, you know? Um, maybe putting coconut oil in her hair, I don't know, something. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm a writer myself and a mother to a 14-month-old who's become some sort of icon here. So I really appreciate this. Thank you so much. Give yourself you. time. Don't, don't, you know, because you'll be frustrated if you, you, you probably think you need to get back. You, we have to be honest, it takes time. But, but I'm going to tell you that about two years, it gets a lot better. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, Chimamanda. Hi. Nice to meet you. It's good to see you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Amelia, and uh, I'm a first-year doctoral student here in the Health Behavior Society Department. And uh, my research really revolves around um, being a visible minority and the health effects of being a visible minority in America. And 
so please forgive me, I have not read your work, Americana, yet. <laughs> but it's going on my Amazon Prime tonight. Um, <laughs> and I wanted to ask you, also I just want to say thank you for the breastfeeding talk. I think that's so brave of you to say in public health. And I have a three-year-old daughter, oh, and I, I went to formula too, so I get it, I get it, I totally get it. <laughs> um, but I wanted to ask you, uh, I, I guess I wanted to maybe push the conversation a little bit further on feminism. And I wanted to ask you if you could provide talking points or thinking points, food for thought, for not only the um, women in this audience, but everyone else, including the men, um, on, using, or on approaching feminism through an intersectional perspective. Um, so I think, you know, um, we heard statistics about you know the the, the wage gap between men and women um, here you know in different occupations, but I think you know we also know from the research that the wage gap isn't just between men and women, but if you add the aspect of race and racialized feminism, um, you see that wage gap go even further. You know, mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to maybe push that conversation and ask you from a public health perspective, since we're all going to eventually be public health practitioners or public health researchers, what do you think we could keep in mind to be sort of self-reflective and just reflexive overall about our positionality and kind of under understanding the nuances of feminism from other intersectional approaches like race or disability um, and other types of marginalized statuses? Mm. I think the simple thing to keep in mind is to wake up every morning and say to yourself, not all women are straight and white. That would be very helpful. I love it. Was that like 10 words? <laughs> I mean, I, you know, it, it, it always struck me as very interesting in, in sort of political discourse in America where they would say, um, women voted for so-and-so, blacks voted for so-and-so. And I think, wait, hold on, where, what about me, right? Where, where was I counted in? Was I counted in as women or as black? Exactly, exactly. But of course, the assumption to that is that women actually meant white women. Exactly. Um, and I, I think, you know, I think it's important to talk about um, race and class. And I mean, all the other things, because I think all those things kind of affect the way that gender works. You know, um, yeah, I, I, but I, I wish I had sort of like a tool to, to share. Sadly, I don't. I think that's a good start. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so there's a question on that side, I think. There's a, yeah. Hi, Chima Amanda, my name is Larissa. So I'm going to be asking a question which was asked anonymously. And the question is, your work, particularly Americana, addresses the gap between the African immigrant and African American experiences, a conversation which has risen to the mainstream lately with the discussion surrounding Black Panther. What similarities or differences do you see in the health issues of Africans versus African Americans? I don't know. I feel like I'm, I'm not equipped to talk about health issues. <laughs> <laughs> Unless I can draw from that first year in Nsuka 20 years ago. <laughs> I will just expand on that question a little bit more and just say, what, what were your thoughts and your feelings about Black Panther? Um, <laughs> do you know, I was actually going to ask you what the conversations are around Black, because I, I don't know. So are these conversations about how what are they about African American versus African? My understanding, my, what my takeaway was, was um, the movie did a good job at talking about some of the different perspectives which Africans have about African Americans, which African Americans have about Africans, which white people have about Africans, mm -hmm. about the continent. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you've seen it. I guess that would be a good starting point. <laughs> All right, so back to the question then. <laughs> Look, I've been very busy. I've also been in hibernation. <laughs> I've been in writing hibernation. I haven't, um, but I'm very excited about Black Panther. I'm, no, I, this is true. I'm happy that Black Panther exists. Mm -hmm. 
I'm happy about what it represents, right? And, and it's important for us to, because representation matters, right? Popular culture matters. And my nephew was in tears watching that thing. And my nephew is a top 24-year-old cool kid. And he was in tears. And that utterly broke me. And um, so I'm going to see it, maybe this weekend, actually. My husband and I, we haven't seen it. We've just seen it. <laughs> but, but, but really, to go back to American and African American versus African, one of the things that I wanted to write about, obviously, is, is blackness and, and the, 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 the wide range of blackness, if that makes sense. I, I didn't think of myself as black until I came to the US. And so discovering blackness, becoming black in America, was one of the things I wanted to write about and what it meant and how I started off pushing it away, rejecting it, saying to people um, in undergrad, they would say, come to Black Students Union. I'd be like, no, I'm not black, I'm Nigerian. <laughs> and I realize now, looking back, that, that, it's, that even that I did that is an indictment of racism in America. Why, why was I rejecting blackness? I mean, if blackness is completely value free, why was I rejecting it? Mm -hmm. But I was rejecting it because I knew that in this country, it's not value free, that it's automatically something to which all kinds of negative stereotypes are attached. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I had the professor at Drexel who was surprised that I wrote this essay. And when he saw me, he was like, and I realized, again, he didn't expect me to be black, um, especially as I was using my initial, not my name. So, um, so I wanted to write about, and, and of course now I've become very happily black. Right. And, it, and it took a process. I mean, and I think also that blackness, in some ways, is also a political identity that one takes by choice. You know, you can look black in the world, but there is a kind of knowing that you're t accepting that you're black, <laughs> loving that you're black, which I have come to do. Um, and it's it's a very American thing, right? because when I when I get on the plane and I and I get off in Lagos, I don't remember race. It doesn't occur to me to think about how many black people are in this room. I don't even have to think about it when I'm here. I know already, because I've looked, just one look, and I know how many black faces are here. And I can bet you every black person in this country does that. Because you kind of want to know who will have your back if something happens. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> well, I'm actually only half kidding. <laughs> I'm only half kidding. <laughs> it's true, though. But, um, but I wanted to write about how important it is for um, for us, as, as people who are black but not African American, to engage with the history of African Americans mm -hmm. and to understand how there's a lot that we're able to do today that is really a direct consequence of sacrifices that were made by African Americans. And I sometimes think that, we, that that's not something that's yeah. as sort of engaged with in immigrant communities of color, um, that it's very easy to, to sit back and enjoy the privileges we have and kind of look down on people who, because of the policies in this country, have been held back. Hello. Hi. Thank you, thank you so much for coming. You have written some of my very favorite sentences of all time. You're, I feel like reading a book is like taking a walk on the beach and finding these incredible seashells. And I just want to like take oh. the sentences and take them home. That is so lovely. Thank you. <laughs> um, this, so thinking about your idea of the one story, to some extent, this school is founded on the idea that Africa is a continent in need of saving. Mm. Um, and that's like the story that people use to justify a lot of the research over lots of years. Um, and I think it still exists. I think there's still um, like this idea that it's our responsibility from the West to go out and like. Get, take the West and save the rest of the, the world. And, and often that is like those stories, as we know in the past, were used like also to take a lot of like resources and to, out of Africa. Um, and also there, that history comes with like lots of health inequities where there is some need for people with training in health to work in parts of the world. So I feel this tension between the story that we know being wrong and colonial and allowing for a lot of very problematic, very violent history, but also that there's like still health needs. And I wonder how you add nuance and how you bring others, how do we bring other stories to the table? Hmm. Oh, I don't know. I think it's... <laughs> It's a very important thing, and I don't know the answer. What I will say is, yes, that story is colonial and needs changing, but it's not a reason to, to then do nothing. 
And I think that there is still a role for the West in, in healthcare in, on the continent of Africa. In other words, I, I suppose my point is that the, the, there is a way to do it well. There is a way to do it in a way that, um, that isn't colonial and, isn't, and doesn't become a kind of um, masturbation. So it doesn't become about the, mm. about the doer, about the goodness of the doer, about the pleasure of the doer, really. Which, which is really what I would say I have problems with. So I, I'm really not a person who would say, oh, you know, don't go to Africa, you're, you're a colonial person. Because actually, increasingly, I'm thinking about these things in terms of righting historical wrongs. And, so, and, and also, I, I, I'm starting to think about that also in terms of refugees. So that, that this whole sort of conversation about refugees, particularly in Europe, um, for me, is I, you know, I keep thinking, well, but 150 years ago, you went to Africa, you didn't have visas, nobody asked you to come. You know, you sort of go in there, you, you plunder, you, you do whatever you want. It's not that surprising that 100 years later, they kind of want to come to your place. And so I, I think maybe that should frame the conversation. <laughs> Just in a, in a sort of a, as a moral basis. And so in that way, I kind of think about health work, that it might actually be a good way to think about it, which is to say, that there is a certain kind of responsibility, I think, that the West has. And I'm not saying this in the way, I mean, I can just so imagine somebody from the right saying, well, what you're saying is Africans are not responsible for that. That's not what I'm saying, right? But I am saying that colonialism, which was a brutal and terrible dictatorship, um, resulted in countries that were never going to work. I mean, Nigeria is a country that was not set up to work. If you read just basic Nigerian history and, and, and colonial policy, there is no way that country would have emerged from the dictatorship that was colonialism and somehow flowered into this wonderful democracy. It just would not have happened. What I do think, though, is that the extent of the failure is our responsibility. I think that our leaders could have stolen a bit less money, and then maybe, maybe the roads would be slightly better. But do I think our institutions would be flourishing? No. I don't. And, and so I kind of think that that might be a sort of a, just a, even, even as a theoretical framework to think about how to do work in Africa. And also listening to people. I just really believe in local knowledge, in, in just asking people what they think they need. You know, because people know. I mean, I, it, it amazes me sometimes in reading um, accounts of foreigners who go to Africa, how little they know Right, because they go in with all of these ideas in their heads, and in the end, they just don't know very much. And I, I just really believe in local knowledge. I, I think that people know how best to organize their reality. Hi, um, Chimamanda. I'm a big fan. I came to see you in uh, Ellicott City when you gave a talk at the library there. My wife and I oh, really? enjoy uh, all your material. Um, Thank you. But so in our in one of the one of the things that al always comes to to the fore whenever I, we listen to your talks or read something that you wrote is um, it almost seems like when I hear you talk about feminism and the differences between the way women are raised and men are raised, I feel like it sometimes misses a racial component. Hmm. And um, so Alice, Wa so I mean, for for instance, right, you talked about how men are not, women are raised to like say, oh, make sure this person likes you, make sure this is nice, don't be too loud, don't be too this or that, and that men are not raised that way. Well, maybe that's true for white men, but for black men, you're very much raised with the aspect of being sure that your presentation is acceptable to the majority class. Mm. But anyway, aside from that, but my point is, <laughs> my point is No, I hear you, I, that, I, I, and I take your point. Yeah. But I'm good, but go, yeah, go on. So, but my point is, so Alice Walker, right? So she was, she was unsatisfied with feminism as the way it was presented in the late 70s, early 80s. And so she came up with the idea of womanism mm. that incorporated some of the black identity and um, celebrated some of the feminine natures that are in, embodied in a, in a woman. Um, but she still kept the idea that men and women should be treated equal in a lot of the things that you, that you, um, that you espouse to. And I'm just wondering if you've ever identified with womanism? Have you considered it? Do you like it? Do you not like it? Or like, I never heard you talk about it publicly. No, I haven't because it's not, it's, um, 
First of all, Alice Walker also said that really for her, womanism is feminism for black women. Mm, yeah. So, but there is also a part of me that, that, that people who have embraced womanism and have made it out to be something that, that makes me uncomfortable, which is there is a kind of, um, it makes a fetish of fertility and motherhood and, and a kind of woman as nurturer. Those things make me uncomfortable because I don't think, I think anybody can be a nurturer. Um, I don't, I, and so there's a, there's a kind of, um, I also don't think that women are special. And I say this because there are also elements of womanism, I think that, um, and I don't think this is what Alice Walker intended. But I've spoken to women who kind of feel that it's this, you know, where you're, you're a queen, that sort of thing. Actually, you're not. You're just a regular human being. You're not. <laughs> right? And I say this because I think that to buy into those ideas can be dangerous. Because if you're special and if you're, then then it makes sense to hold you at a higher, um, to have a higher moral standard for you, which I think is very bad for women. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's the reason that. So, so I'll use a very common example. If a man cheats we're more willing to forgive. If a woman cheats, we're not. Because somehow we say, you're a woman, you're better. You should be better. But actually, no. Um, and so, the, 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 so for me, I've never, I like feminism, I like the word, because for me, it's the dictionary meaning. But obviously, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to pretend that I don't know that the history of Western feminism has been racist. That's really what it is, that there was racism as part of the early American feminist movement, um, which understandably then left many women of color feeling alienated. I think that the American feminist movement is trying to address that. I don't know enough, because I don't really feel a part of the American feminist movement. Um, I think that Western feminism, being the feminism that is most documented, is therefore often seen as the only feminism. When people talk about first wave and second wave, I don't feel a connection to it. I don't even, I'm not even sure I entirely know what it means. I mean, actually, I kind of do, but, but you know, I, I don't really feel a connection to it because it's not my own story. Right? Mine is a feminism that started because I was a child watching my world, and I didn't understand why only men could break the color knot. And when I asked, I was told, oh, because they're men. And I was just like, it doesn't make sense. I didn't understand why the boy in my class had to be the, the, the class monitor, because he was a boy, even though my teacher had said the best student would be the monitor. And I had gotten 10 over 10, the boy got 9 over 10. <laughs> right? So that, I mean, so, and, and, and it's, my feminism is also one that increasingly is looking at pre-colonial Africa mm -hmm. as, as inspiration. Because I think that there was a lot that changed with, with gender when colonialism and Christianity came. So this is all to say that um, to answer your question, no, I haven't thought about womanism um, because of the certain ideas that I've, I've heard women talk about who embrace womanism. I do think that for many black women, womanism is simply their way of saying that feminism, the way that America has practiced it, excluded them. And I think that they have a point. Mm -hmm. right? um, but, but just ideas of motherhood being venerated, it, doesn't, it, it just doesn't work for me. I am a very happy mother. I think motherhood is glorious. But I don't think that we should conflate that. I don't think that it should be the core of what it means to talk about being a woman. Because there's some women who choose not to be mothers. right? And there, there are many societies in which that is a thing of shame. And we should, we should stop. You know, we, should, we shouldn't do that. And um, so, so I, I probably haven't answered your question. But, but again, no, I'm, I'm feminist, not womanist. Um, I like the dictionary meaning. And also, also, I should say that I do think that while there are all of these sort of different ways in which gender um, affects women, I also think that there is such a thing as that category women. And I say this because in one of the classes, was it the class I took at Hopkins or maybe at Yale? I remember just being confused because we sat in class talking about is there such thing as women? And I remember thinking, look, I understand the world's supposed to be very intellectual here, but please. <laughs> um, and so I want to say that because I think that there are certain things that a white woman in Iceland, certain things that I will, that she will get and I will get about her reality that you, my black brother, will not get. And so that's what I mean when I say that there are still certain things that, um, 
I believe that there's such a thing as women, which is why I choose feminism. I choose feminism because I also believe in a kind of um, cross-racial, cross-whatever collective. Hello, Chimamanda. Uh, my name is Joe, and I'll be reading out a question from the audience. Mm -hmm. So how do you think we can go about reclaiming the face of Africa? How can we give the voice back to the continent to speak for itself? Reclaiming a voice for Africa. Yes. How can we give the voice back to, uh, to the continent for it to speak for itself? This is the kind of question that I just, yeah. <laughs> How do we give a voice back to Africa for Africa to speak for itself? Yeah, this is a glass of voice. Africa shall drink it. I, I mean, <laughs> sorry, sorry. It's a bit too, um, I don't know. That, that, that there's, there's an abstraction to the question that's difficult to actually respond to and, and have a serious face. But uh, <laughs> well, should I move on to another question? Then? <laughs> by, reading, <laughs> by reading African stories that are told by Africans. Um, this one says, any tips for, a young, for young Africans who have lived in the U.S. for a long time but still feel ties to their homeland but would also, not, would also feel out of place, culturally speaking, how do you readjust, especially of, if thinking of going back to make a difference in society? I think the first step would be to think about going back full stop. Don't make it about to make a difference in society because then I think it will shape the way you go back and you're going to go back with some sort of smug idea that you know all the answers. I would say go back. I mean, Africa has room for all kinds of people. So you go to Lagos, the, the places where the returnees hang out, <laughs> and my cousin, my cousin jokes about when she sees somebody, she's like, I can tell that person is a returnee, look at what they're wearing, <laughs> right? Um, so there's space for everyone. I really think, and I think that there is, I think there is work that can be done by people who have an understanding of both worlds. Mm. Um, that, that if you have lived in the US and you understand the US, but also you have, a, you have these cultural ties to, to the continent, that you're in a position to, A, challenge certain things. You're in a position to, um, you speak the language that certain people understand, and those certain people might be in a position to, I don't know, give you funding for your project, whatever. This is the reality. So I do think that, um, that they should go back if they want to. I, I, I think that there's room for, for everyone. I also think that it's possible to be two things. I mean, we don't have to sort of say, well, if you haven't spent your whole life in Africa, and well, then you're not African. They're, they're different. I think, I think to be um, Nigerian-American, to be Nigerian, th they're things that intersect, and they're ways to work together. Um, I'll take a final question here, and then uh, one from the audience physically. It says, for those of us who are in exile from back home, unable to return because of the political environment, what suggestion do you have to continue being engaged and helping the communities we have left behind? Wait, who's exiled? The person uh, wishes to remain anonymous. <laughs> Can we know where the, 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 what country this person is from? Let's see if the person puts that. No, it's not here. <laughs> no? I, I mean, I'm just thinking about what, what, I just feel that there is a kind of romance to the idea of exile. And there's a part of me that just wants to, I want to, I want to deconstruct that idea of exile. What does it mean really? And which, which country is it that, I mean, you know, Mugabe is no longer there. Uh, and even I wasn't in exile. Right. <laughs> So I think if you don't want to go back, just say that you don't want to go back. <laughs> and then I don't know, get on, get on Facebook and have fights with people <laughs> on the continent for not knowing how to fix everything because if you were there, you would do it differently and everything will be fine. Hi, thank you so much for coming. This has been really enlightening. Um, so you talked about how women are socialized to shape um, their lives around maleness, um, and that really spoke to me. Um, and I wanted to ask you, like, for a solution, basically. <laughs> um, like, how do we then mitigate the consequences of that socialization now as adult women? Um, what can we do as women to rise above the male gaze and detach ourselves and our self-worth from it? Um, I, like, the, the one thing that I found to be, like, 
really helpful for myself is like basically looking around the room and all the really badass, powerful, intelligent, brilliant women that are here and like trying to draw inspiration from that, but like I need something more, so. <laughs> so do I, my dear, so do I. I, <laughs> I wish I knew and I spend way too much time thinking about this and just observing and reading and watching and being angry. But, but you said, I think you put it so well about detaching our sense of self-worth and I think of feminism as, as a, a personal journey and, and possibly a lifelong personal journey of unlearning for adult women and for men. And so it, it's, it's a process, right? It's a process. I don't think that there is something for which I was reading this study recently about how baby girls and baby boys are treated differently from the time that they're born. And and actually, this morning, I was looking at, uh, we got many presents when my daughter was born from family and friends. And one of them was a lovely picture case in which the words were re written, a baby girl so sweet and, uh, a baby girl so sweet and soft um, feels your life makes, makes it complete. And, I, and, and it's lovely, and, and I actually did put a picture of my baby in there, but I was looking at it and suddenly thought, had it been a boy, would, would, would it be mm. the same? I don't think we would say a baby boy so sweet and soft. Mm. And it made me think, my God, even this, I mean, so that the thinking, it's so, it, there's just a difference. Yeah. And I think it's being aware, being alert, it's really about unlearning and just a, a kind of conscious, talking to yourself, really. I mean, you have to be your own therapist all the time. Um, and, and I think for men, it also has to involve a kind of um, constant self-questioning. There are some men who, the minute a woman wants to talk about her experience, reflexively, they're looking for ways to shut it down. They're looking for ways to say, well, is it really because you're a woman? Isn't that really because you A, B, C, D, E, right? And I think for men, it would require a lot of, why am I shutting this down? Why am I reflexively saying, is it really because you're a woman? Mm -hmm. um, and I, in my, in my, sort of my experience has been that, well, first of all, I should say that I really didn't get the memo that, I, that I'm inferior to boys and men. I, I didn't. Which in itself is a problem. Because there's something about occupying your space in the world as a woman and making it known that you really think that you're, everybody's equal. That makes people very angry. Both men and women. This is the thing, right? Because you know, as women, we're also raised, we're raised with misogyny. We're raising our world is misogynistic. It's like the air we breathe in this world is misogynistic. So we all sort of, women are misogynistic. And it's always constantly, for me, when I, when I meet a woman and I just sense that I, I, I'm not sure I like her, I find myself questioning myself. Mm -hmm. How much of this is about her being a woman, right? And, and I want to make sure that it's really that I dislike her for reasons that are valid, not because, no, this is true. <laughs> and I think it's important for all of us to do that because I think that women, that there's a kind of automatic dislike that women get, and half the time it's because they're women. I used to get so angry with people who kept saying, oh, I just don't like Hillary Clinton, I just don't like her. And I used to think, why is this even the discourse that we're having? Right? I mean, I can understand disagreeing on policy and whatever, but, but I knew that for many of them it wasn't that. Because had she been a man with exactly the same policies, the, the response would have been different. So really for me, it's about that we constantly have to unlearn. And you know, sort of, you, you have to do your, your own therapy, look at yourself in the mirror and be like, you know what, that guy is an asshole, I don't need him to like me. <laughs> <laughs> I think we, we have time have for nine, nine five more, more people. Uh, five more minutes worth of questions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Five more minutes worth of questions. Okay. Okay. Um, oh. <laughs> me is me. Hi. Oh. Oh wait. I'm sorry. You can go first. Sorry, I've been waiting a very long time. For my <laughs> I agree. <laughs> Hi, Chimamanda. My Hi. name is Adeze. I'm very excited that you're here. Um, I have two questions. Um, the first one is kind of serious. The second one is kind of fun. Um, I really appreciated what you said about um, kind of being the importance of being protective um, of good ideas, but also being open to listening to people who may differ from us. And I wonder, I know you talk at a lot of universities, and I wonder if you could maybe say a few words, because right now at a lot of colleges, there's a lot of conversation about diversity and inclusion. Um, but expanding that conversation in terms of, you know, being um, 
open to um, different religions or different geographic areas. Um, how do you think institutions like Johns Hopkins can um, really make a commitment to diversity and inclusion, um, but also open a space up for you know different ideas, but also protect people that may be harmed by um, these some other ideas that may not All right, be. I feel like you're really trying to say something, but you're not saying it. Can you just say it? Wait, is there, is there is, so religion, yes. tell me, uh, tell me, just use, say your friend, if it's your story. <laughs> <laughs> but I just feel like there's something interesting here we're not getting at. Um, no. I <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I just, I don't want to put you on the spot, but you know, yeah. I'm. <laughs> no, I, I, I know what you mean, but I think sometimes the perception is that at, you know, I guess liberal colleges, there's kind of an aversion to religion, for example. Mm. Um, but people then also, I also hold the belief that, you know, certain religious ideas can be helpful to us. Um, mm. So how do we, I mean, there's separation of church and state, separation of school and state, but how do we um, maintain, I think, a commitment to diversity mm. and inclusion, but also, you know, protect people that may be harmed by, you know, Mm. Ideas mm. that, yeah, mm. are not. Okay. Yeah. And then, can I ask my second question or should I ask it after? Yeah, answer it really quickly if it's. Yeah. yeah. The second question is just what Nigerian music do you like? <laughs> are you listening to? I like Fino. Um, and for me, it's an example of how you can, that you, you can choose to a certain extent. Um, the work of people who don't necessarily share your ideology, which is to say that Fino is not feminist. <laughs> <laughs> but I love Fino's music. I, I, I love it because there's a kind of rootedness in Ibo, Ibo-ness. There's a kind of unapologetic um, sort of uh, his tribute to high life, Ibo high life that I love. So I love Fino. I like flavor. Um, I, I like Omawumi. Um, who else do I like? Yeah, I mean, in general, I like Nigerian music, but I, I, I can't do rap. I just, I mean, any kind of, you know, so I'm not, I'm not cool like that, sad. <laughs> I like high life. Um, I also like Celeste Nopo. I like the old people. I love Celeste Nopo. I find him so wise. It's just, just, just drops of sheer wisdom. Um, Mike Eja, I love as well. Um, Onye Kowe, no, I adore. All right. Uh, <laughs> but you know what? I think, I think, I, 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 you know, I hear you about religion. There's some, the thing about the left in general is that, um, and I also think the left has a point. I kind of feel like I'm sounding like Obama now. No, <laughs> on the other hand. I know. Well, on the other hand, <laughs> sometimes I used to be like, take a fucking step. But, um, uh, <laughs> but it's true, though. This is what happens when you think about things a lot. You sort of start to see. So I see that the, the left's position is, is one in which religion is seen only through the lenses of, its, um, of all the ways in which it has held people back. It's, it, and it has in many ways. But I also hear you, which is that I think that religion can be a force for good. I think in many ways it has been a force for not good, but it can be a force for good. And maybe, maybe liberal circles are not as um, open to, to religion being part of the conversation. I mean, just thinking about it now, I can see, and particularly Christianity, which is very interesting. Um, but you know. <laughs> So how, how to change that? Write a fierce letter. Tell them I am a Pentecostal Nigerian and I will firebomb you with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> <laughs> Tell them you will bring Pastor Adeboye to show them Pepe. <laughs> and then they will just open up. But you know, I mean, I think it's maybe bringing up these points. And, because I, I wonder if maybe there are people here who haven't really thought about it, right? Um, I, for example, I, I was raised Catholic. I'm, I consider myself a person who just is agnostic now. But, but I, I, my child, I'm raising her Catholic because I want her to have the choice. And, you know, I, I, and my experience has been that there are people for whom religion is the reason they do well. The, the reason that they, um, I personally don't think I need God to give me cookies before I'm good. Right? That's my own thing. I think that goodness is its own reward. But I realize that there are people for whom the promise of reward from God is the reason that they do things that are ethical. And it's important for us to engage with that, especially in, even in public health, right? And it's impossible, I think, to engage honestly with the continent of Africa without engaging with Christianity. I'm yeah. sorry, it is impossible. Mm -hmm. Because swaths of sub-Saharan Africa are just in this Pentecostal frenzy. 
you can dislike it all you want. If you don't want to engage with it, you're not going to reach people. I mean, mm. I find myself lately thinking about, I want to go through a study of the Bible, and I want to start to try and craft a Christian feminism. Um, because I see that many women to whom I speak about feminism are deeply unhappy in their marriages. Uh, just really, but they tell you, the Bible says I should submit. So I find that I want to, because I think you can use the Bible to, to prove anything, anything. <laughs> so uh, what I want to do, and please, if there are women here who want to join me in this project, please, seriously, let's do a study of the Bible. Let's find ways to tell them that that, pe that bit about submitting, let's find a way to counter it with other parts so that women start to take, take action. But I, I, sorry, I don't know. Thank you so much, <laughs> thank you. Um, so my question actually ties into a little of what you just said. So how do you kind of intersect this, talking about your daughter, especially like babies, I don't have any kids, but it'll happen one day. Um, how do you intersect your cultural beliefs growing up in Nigeria with the beliefs you gained on your own and from the diaspora in terms of like raising your daughter? Like how do you keep the Nigerian roots, but at the same time being like, but that, Mm -hmm. And then like on top of that, like how do you go back to your mom being like, no, I'm raising her this way because of this, that, and the third. Mm -hmm. Like how do you just intersect? Oh, you all just of do. That? But you I should I should, but I should, but I should, I should push back a bit about because there isn't I was raised in a in a household that was relatively progressive, right? So actually the only thing that my mother and I have disagreed on is my daughter's hair. Um, my so? daughter is two and a half. I've, I haven't combed her hair. I finger detangle because mm. I don't believe that she should be put through pain at two and a half because, I, because of my vanity. Because that's mm. really what it is. If her hair is perfect, it's to make my vanity happy. It has nothing to do with her. She doesn't care. Mm. Um, so that's the only place where my mother would be like, are you going to do anything to her hair? And I'm like, no. <laughs> She's happy as she is. But apart from that, um, I, you know, the, the, my, my daughter speaks Igbo. I, I, I'm determined that she be bilingual, so we speak only Igbo to her at home. She's just started preschool, she's speaking Igbo to her American teachers, and they're all kind of like, oh my god, what language is that? And we're like, yeah. <laughs> and, um, so, so I'm teaching her that, because, no, but it's important to me. I think, it's a, I think that when you have a sense of identity, it's so important for mm. to give, it's a gift to give a child. Absolutely. But there are other things, like um, not thinking about gender in raising her, which I think my parents are okay with. So she doesn't have dolls. I, I will never say to her, this is what little girls do. You know, I'm looking at her as a person, I'm going to follow her lead and whatever she's interested in, but I'm trying very hard to make her be outdoorsy. So, so I want her to run around, and she's really taken to with that child. I mean, it's, she's exhausted. <laughs> But, but, but uh, the things that I didn't get, I mean, I like to joke about how by the time she's 10 years old, I want her to be able to change my car tires. So I won't have to pay somebody to do it. But <laughs> the reason, <laughs> because I can't do it. Now, why can't I do it? Because when I was being raised, I had brothers who were told things like that were things boys did. And then there were things girls did. And now as an adult who doesn't have any practical skills, I feel bereft, right? I'm like, it would be nice if I could sort of fix things. I can't, I'm hopeless, it's really terrible. And so, and I think a lot of it, I mean a lot of it I have to say is also just my not having whatever the part of the brain that does that. But I think a part of it is also that I wasn't socially conditioned to think that I, I should and could. And so I'm raising her, um, and um, it's not really a clash with. So, so I suppose my point is that let's be careful about what we define. There's a very conservative Nigerian way of looking at the world. And then there's a way that's still Nigerian, but not as conservative. And that's the route that I'm taking. She's, yeah. So when, when you have those kids, um, let them be the African selves. And um, yeah. But also the most important thing, teach them that there's a difference between respect and fear. Yeah. I think a lot of our cultures tell us that to fear an adult is to respect an adult. That's not true. Thank you so much. We apologize, we won't be taking any more questions. I'm sure we really all had, had a very beautiful and interesting and funny afternoon. I really, did, I used to watch her TED Talks, but seeing her in person and the wish, which is making all laugh, in fact, I'm going to remember this for a long time. Now, Friday the 13th has, some, has a new meaning for me. That's <laughs> really so, um, I'll be giving the vote of thanks. Um, we would like to thank everyone here present, Mr. Adichie, faculty and staff, and my fellow students. 
It's my privilege to be given a note of thanks at this important Faces of Africa event. I'm Rashidat, I'm the Vice President of the African Public Health Network. And on behalf of the APHN and the entire organizing committee, I would like to sincerely thank our special guest, Chimamanda, for finding time out. for taking time out of our busy schedule to honor our invitation, our very persistent invitation. <laughs> My highlight and favorite part of this event is um, how, um, to my fellow women, we are to be yourselves and support fellow women so that our species can continue to exist. And also, as you continue along your career path, endeavor to break the chain of developing a single story for any individual. And to the men, get over yourselves. <laughs> Um, Mr. DK? Can, I, sorry. Huh? can I just say thank you to one particular man, this witty, brilliant man? <laughs> yeah. um, I'll probably chip in that um, the APA chairman were coordinating this event when we were trying to get someone to moderate this event. We were, it was like unanimous to have Vinaya do it because uh, he's, he has a very interesting background. I think he read um, about medical engineering, then he, became, he was a journalist at one point, so he said, oh, it fits this bill, you'll be able to at least do this. Um, Mr. DJ, we are truly inspired by your achievements and we're proud to have you as one of the faces of Africa. I would also like to thank the Student Assembly for co-sponsoring this event. And also, as part of the Faces of Africa 2018 lineup, the APHN and the Public Health Film Society will be screening 93 days at 4 p.m. in Sheldon Hall. If you're interested in knowing about the Ebola 2014 story in Nigeria and why there was no Ebola pandemic, you, you would like to see you in Sheldon Hall at 4 p.m. Also, if you have a pass to the reception, please kindly proceed to the Wall of Wonder at the end of the program. Um, if, you're, if you're opportune to have a pass, she has, Ms. Adichie has gladly um, agreed to sign 10 autographs. So, but you have to be at the reception. So, thank you all for coming, and we hope to see you downstairs. <laughs>